Hello. Hello. That's right. It is YouTube time this time all the time. If you like poetry, if you like literature, if you like cultural history, then you've come to the right place. We make podcasts about all of those things. So be sure to like and share this video. And of course, most importantly, subscribe to the channel so you never miss an upload. Since we mostly make podcasts, you can also find our shows on all the major podcast platforms. So if you found this video, but YouTube isn't your speed for regular podcast listening, head over to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe there. All right. Hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to Close Talking, the world's most popular poetry analysis podcast from Cardboard Box Productions Incorporated. I am co-host Jack Rossiter Munley. And I am your other co-host, Connor McNamara Stratton. And together we read a poem, talk about the poem, and read the poem again. Before we get into today's selection, a quick note that if you like what we do here at Close Talking and have a spare moment... It would mean the world to us if you drop a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Those reviews help boost us up the algorithm and are a great way for us to find new listeners. If you want to get in touch with us, you can find us on so many different social medias. On Twitter, the show is at Close Talking. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn and Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. On Instagram, the show is at Close Talking Poetry. And on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash close talking. We also have a whole website just for the podcast. It is close talking.com where you can find all the past episodes of the show. And Cardboard Box Productions has a newsletter unboxed. So if you go to Cardboard Box Productions Inc.com, you can subscribe for more behind the scenes stuff on Close Talking and on all the literary and cultural history podcasts that Cardboard Box Productions makes. All right, on with the show. Welcome to an all-new episode of Close Talking. I'm one of your co-hosts, Connor McNamara Stratton. And I'm your other co-host, Jack Rossiter Munley. As always, we've got a great poem for you today. And it's going to be even made even more special because we are in the middle of National Poetry Month, which is very exciting, which is why you are listening to this on a third Friday of the the month. I bet you didn't realize it was every second and fourth Friday of every month. But in fact, it is, except for this time, because it's a special month. It's National Poetry Month. Happy Poetry Month. So, <laughs> so we're giving you more of the goodies, more of that real um, stone cold analysis that you, uh, you know, your little Friday commutes or your Saturday dishes Commute. or your Sunday lounges. <laughs> Stone Cold Analysis was going to be my wrestler name when I was trying for the WWE. Oh, wow. A close yeah. second was going to be Anaphora. <laughs> oh, my God. Amazing. Well, as a little sneak peek, next week is very exciting. This week's also very exciting. But next week, we've got something special for you. We are going to have an episode every day for a full week. And they're all going to be about haiku which is a very misunderstood genre, often perverted by the American imagination, just as many things are. I mean, it's really the imagination that's perverting most of the world right now. So, but yeah, we're going to have little shorter episodes. We're going to try to take you through different aspects, different histories of haiku, and um, I think it should be fun. So April, that's a great month. And today we've got a not desperate plea for you to rate us or review us on iTunes. This has been such a successful set of pleading. I mean, I've really never pleaded so well in my life, I think, that I'm going to start sort of trying it out in other parts of my life. But if you have a moment, it really helps. Thank you to everyone who has given us a rating or reviewed us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Okay, without further ado, today's poem is by the poet Nicole Seeley, who is a marvelous poet. And her debut collection is called Ordinary Beast, which I highly, highly recommend. 
Ordinary Beast was published in 2017, and Nicole Seeley is a wonderful poet. She's also the executive director of Cave Canem, which is like one of the coolest and one of the most important, I think, organizations in poetry in America right now. Um, and it was started in 1996, and basically its mission is to support and amplify Black writers and African American voices in poetry. Um, and sort of rectify their underrepresentation. And without further ado, we're going to read her poem, which is called Medical History, which incidentally is the very first poem of her debut collection, Ordinary Beast. Medical History by Nicole Seeley. I've been pregnant. I've had sex with a man who's had sex with men. I can't sleep. My mother has, my mother's mother had asthma. My father had a stroke. My father's mother has high blood pressure. Both grandfathers died from diabetes. I drink, I don't smoke. Xanax for flying. Propranolol for anxiety. My eyes are bad. I'm spooked by wind. Cousin Lily died from an aneurysm. Aunt Hilda, a heart attack. Uncle Ken, wise as he was, was hit by a car as if to disprove whatever theory toward which I write. And I understand the stars in the sky are already dead. I love this poem so much. Wow. Tell yeah. me tell me of your love. Well, I want to tell you of my love, Jack. And I want to do only that. But first, I have an obligation to our listeners and to myself and to mm. you. Usually, at the beginning of these podcasts, we read the poem and then we give a little synopsis or a play-by-play -play or a plot just to get our feet wet in the kind of what's happening in the poem. And so this poem, as the title indicates, is a medical history of the speaker, or at least it starts that way. And so the poem kind of begins like sort of the way it's like you meet the meet with your doctor. Um, they're kind of like taking your medical history. They're asking you all sorts of questions. You're very uncomfortable. You don't remember like which grandparent had what cancer. And it's very unnerving and I don't like to go to the doctors. So this poem begins kind of that way. I've been pregnant. I've had sex with a man. They're trying to who's had sex with men, getting sexual history. Then it sort of goes through like, you know, the family kind of history of disease and, you know, other health problems. My mother has asthma, stroke, blood pressure, diabetes. Then we kind of move into like the speaker's own personal habits that doctors ask, do you drink, do you smoke? Then the poem changes a little bit. We get to, I'm spooked by wind. And we suddenly are not quite talking about strictly medical history. That's not something you would tell your doctor necessarily. Then we go through different family members and how they died. Cousin Lily died from an aneurysm, heart attack. And then we get to this sort of strange moment um, where Uncle Ken has died by a couple, you know, was hit by a car, sort of accidental death. And then we sort of end with this idea. And I understand the stars in the sky are already dead, which I think is kind of like, you know, the light takes so long to get to us that by the time it gets to us, you know, the light is many millions or billions of years old and the star itself, wherever it is, may have, you know, already died. So that's kind of like, you know, the here and there, the up and down. I don't know. I love this poem for a lot of reasons. One reason that I love it is it takes a kind of a form or a kind of language that is sort of like we already understand or experience, you know, outside the world, you know, like that of a medical history. And then it sort of uses that form to kind of like making deliberate use of language you might not think of as poetic language and moving it into uh, the space of poetry. I think that's an excellent point. And it's something that I definitely responded to in reading this poem, because you do feel like you're eavesdropping on this kind of conversation that you've 
yourself have likely had if you've gone to the doctor and the language for the most part in it, even the little moments that begin to hint that something more is going to happen is very basic, emotionless, clipped language because even when you say, I'm spooked by wind, that's a pretty flat definitive statement. It's a little emotive because you're saying you're spooked by something, but it still fits the form of, I don't drink, I don't smoke, Xanax for flying, I'm spooked by wind. It fits the rhythm of where things have been going. And it really is at that end where it fully opens up and you get this longer sentence about Uncle Ken, which in content fits the structure that's come before of this family member and this medical thing happening to them. But instead of that, you get this extended sentence with a bunch of commas in it and a subordinate clause. And like, you got a whole situation going on where Uncle Ken, wise as he was, was hit by a car. Oh, it's not medical anymore. As if to disprove whatever theory towards which I write. And then you have your last sentence which starts with and, again, a violation of the very basic like grammar school rules of sentence construction that you're taught. You don't start a sentence with and, even though, of course, you can, but you're told not to, basically, which makes it feel continuous. So that already longer, different feeling sentence is, in some ways, though it ends, still feels like it's continuing. And then you get this last sentence about these dead stars, and it's like, whoa, I thought I was in a doctor's office. Turns out I'm in the cosmos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's such a good point about sentence length too so like there's like just a jillion really really short sentences in this poem you know i've been pregnant i can't sleep my father had a stroke i drink i don't smoke so you know we talk a lot about turns in poetry you know kind of like the moments at which the poem's you know trying to get at something else or move you know move away from where it started um, and so oftentimes to kind of like signal the turn to the reader, the poem will change in some way, like at the syntactical level or uh, the language level. And so here, I think one example of that is that long sentence that is, you know, two and a half lines. Similarly, also, spoiler alert, this poem is a sonnet. I love sonnets. I'm always trying to talk about sonnets, and I really restrain myself from putting too many sonnets on the podcast but this sonnet is so good. And it's not a quote unquote proper traditional sonnet. In some ways, it doesn't have like a Shakespearean ABAB rhyme scheme type vibe, but it does have 14 lines. And importantly, it has what they call the volta, um, which is a fancy word that just means turn. Usually the ninth line after, you know, the first eight, you get the volta or the kind of turn. And here, the poem, that is exactly when I'm spooked by wind appears. That's the first moment that sort of deviates from the form, quote unquote, of the medical history. And so you see a kind of pairing of like two kinds of forms. You know, you have your medical history form, which is this list of symptoms or histories or whatever. Then you have a sonnet form, which has its own way that it wants to go. And one of the exciting things for a poet who's writing is to sort of see how those two can like interact in tension with each other. And so here the, the sonnet form dictates when the medical history form will sort of break off and break free. And so in the ninth line, you get, I'm spooked by wind. And then two lines down, you get Uncle Ken and you get that long sentence. And yeah, I just think that's, I just love it. I love it. And the last thing I'll say a little bit about form, at least for now, is that in addition to the medical history thing, it's a, got a kind of list form, which is just like, I've done this, I can't do that. Which is to say, in writing and literature, there's like many kinds of ways to get momentum, you know, and that's one of the key challenges of how do I propel the poem forward. Obviously, narrative momentum, very common. And there's actually another poem in Nicole Seeley's book called And, which every word has the sound ah in it. And it's like very virtuosic. And in that, in that poem, it's like just the sound is propelling you because it's like so rhythmic and it's like an incantation. So here, the list poem as a kind of subgenre has its own momentum in that it's like, when are you going to depart from the list? 
what's the tension between what you expect from a li the list and what you get from the list. And so the first sort of eight lines kind of build up a sense of expectation, I think, about where the poem is going and, and the kinds of things that the list will allow, right? So that when I'm spooked by wind comes, it's like a noticeable departure because it doesn't fit the list. And in that sort of deviation, you have a tension that gives the poem like momentum to sort of get it to the end of the poem. If that makes sense. Yeah, I wasn't necessarily expecting one to materialize, but I almost felt like you're moving towards a diagnosis just because of the medical setting. And like the doctor gathers information so that they can tell you something about yourself. And even if it's not a diagnosis, it's an assessment of some sort. And I was the first time I read the poem in reading through the list, it was almost like, OK, 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 like I get it. This is what happened to this family member and that one and that one. Where's the like, what's the end? What comes after the list almost? Because it felt like because of the medical context, there was an after the list. And the poem does sort of get there. I think when it deviates from the list, that felt like the quote unquote after to me, I guess, even though it's still contained within the list. I think you could read it either way, but that's just a function of kind of where I was at when I first went through it. Yeah. Yeah. You've got me thinking one of the key parts of the poem is this you know, Uncle Ken, wise as he was, was hit by a car. And then there's, as if to disprove whatever theory toward which I write. And there's this like theory. And I feel like, what is the theory? You know, um, that's like, seems to be a key question. I have some thoughts about it, but I'm, I'm curious what you think. Yeah, I also puzzled over that. And I don't know that I came to any particularly satisfactory conclusions for myself about it. Uh, I'm still wondering what the theory might be. I go a couple of directions with it. One of which is that because of what comes after it, and I understand the stars in the sky are already dead, every reference point in the poem on the list is an illness or a sickness or a means of death. Even Uncle Ken, we're learning how he died. Or it's something that's probably not good for you. So the, the most positive is I don't smoke. And that's still stated in the negative. And even the ones that could be seen as neutral, like Xanax for flying, propranolol for anxiety, there's still medicines needed to counteract a fault or what could be perceived as a fault. Like I am afraid of flying, so I have to take a Xanax. I get anxiety, so I have to take this medicine. It's like remedies for something that is for lack of a better or gentler term like wrong and even uncle ken we're talking about how he died so even in the change in the poem it happens with something that you're spooked by the wind and then it talks about how your cousin died your aunt hilda who had a heart attack and then uncle ken and how he died and even that last bit about the stars is like they're dead so the theory towards which i write the best i came up with is that in describing someone's medical history or in describing it to your doctor, you are hoping that they will better understand your body and your needs as a patient and that they will then be able to better help you be well and live longer. And so maybe the theory towards which she's writing is about this fetishization of health and life extension at all costs. And there's maybe a reading in here where it's not wrong to die. It's not the absolute worst thing that could happen to end up dying. Uh, not that I think the poem is advocating death, but I think it could in some ways be writing against what can be a dominant narrative, particularly in Western medicine, about preventing death at almost all costs. Actually, because I've been binge watching Game of Thrones, Fuego de Tronos, as it is sometimes referred to. And because I've been getting through it in anticipation of, of this, the final season, there's a, a part in the beginning in the first season where Ned Stark is talking about his relationship to death. And there's a bunch of stuff about death, but he talks about it. And in, in the context of him being a warrior, he says, you think my life is some precious thing. I learned to die a long time ago. And so it's that there's things that matter more to him than his own life or his own body. There's, there's other stuff out there. Um, and I got a little flavor of that in the poem. 
I think that was partially informed by knowing that Nicole Seeley is a black woman and the relationship that black female bodies have to the medical establishment, particularly with a poem title like Medical History, um, which sounds very officious and cold. And the history of medicine is one of patriarchal oppression, largely, and the use of bodies that were deemed either less than human by the powers in charge or that were deemed disposable in some way, using them up until very, very recently. There are a bunch of really awful medical tests being done well into the 20th century. I think as somebody who might be writing against some of the orthodoxies or whose answers to these kinds of questions might not be taken seriously, I was getting that kind of potentially, I don't know, adversarial flavor maybe. And I was looking for a way in which the poem might be writing against it. And that was the closest I found to it. But I'm also not wholly satisfied with that reading. And I'm also curious for your thoughts on it. Yeah, I feel like I'm on a similar wavelength. One thing that when you, you know, when you're bringing up like the impact of race and racism and health and health disparities, there's sort of been a lot of, it seems like recent research and studies that have come out, which are sort of those studies that come out that are like kind of obvious, but are like confirming, like confirming what people already knew sort of thing, but that basically black Americans, you know, experience much higher rates of like chronic stress um, and also like a whole host of other illnesses and issues that come like from that stress and sort of other reasons, you know, and specifically, you know, diabetes and heart disease um, and high blood pressure are sort of all issues that affect African-Americans more, you know, disproportionately. Yeah, it's interesting because I, it, in the book, Ordinary Beast, Nicole Seeley devotes a lot of time kind of excavating various narratives or representations of race and racism and is thinking a lot about that. And it doesn't sort of come up explicitly in this poem, but I do feel like it's there. And it made me think of this other part because the poem sort of says, you know, Uncle Ken is disproving this theory by being hit by a car. Why would being hit by a car disprove Seeley's or the speaker's theory. The obvious possible answer is that so it's an accidental death, right? And especially when you sort of get in the way that the poem is is delivering it, which is like a pretty relentless listing of all of these diseases and stuff and in a way that seems like very like deterministic or something. So like my mother has, my mother's mother had asthma, right? Uh, my father had a stroke. My father's mother has high blood pressure. Both grandfathers died from diabetes. There's this kind of like sketching of a family that's all sort of afflicted by these conditions. And it seems to me that in part, the speaker is like, the theory is like that the speaker is sort of fated to die or die early, or die from a, a condition such as these. And then when I think about it in the context, like America and race-related health disparities, it does make me think of like health disparities are emblematic of the ways that white supremacy is set up to, you know, cause Black Americans early deaths, right? And not just in the way of, you know, police shootings or things like that, although certainly Seeley and would include that as one of, you know, a very trenchant issue, but that even in the way of, I don't know, there's a, there's a kind of distance that people put between like health and health conditions and the sort of societal forces and, you know, potentially this theory toward which the speaker is writing is kind of connecting those things and sort of making an argument these these deaths are predetermined by the, you know, white supremacist state or something like that. And that Uncle Ken is messing it all up because he just got hit by a car or whatever, which is like very funny in a very uh, dark way. I think that's right on because also that last line, and I understand the stars in the sky are already dead, is the button on that, which is, again, this sort of puts this faded to die air on the on the speaker. The other part of that moment is the toward which I write part. It's a self-reflexive moment. And it's a moment at which 
the poem becomes aware of itself as a poem being written. You know, the speaker is a is a it's a poet writing the poem, right? Not just this isn't just describing some event. And so what that does is kind of like change the poem from what could be like uh, you know, a pretty hard hitting like indictment of something. The toward which I write moment does a little bit is kind of like make the whatever statement or anything that the poem might be making, it it opens it up to a little more uncertainty because the poem is sort of still being written. And the poet, the speaker is no longer maybe like an authoritative voice, but is just the poet working through something. And I don't really know exactly where that goes, but uh, that seemed like quite, that seemed very interesting to me. And also the way that it's phrased, you know, like toward which I write, and maybe this is reading very far into it, but grammatically it felt a little more formal, I guess, than a lot of the other poems in that you could say, as if to disprove whatever theory I'm writing toward, you know, or that's, just as if to disprove my theory. Yeah. As if to disprove my theory, but rather this like toward which I write is, you know, it's grammatically perfect, but it's also more heightened in some kind of way, perhaps. That whole sentence feels that way because it also has that very quick uncle Ken wise as he was, you know, it does that very abrupt it's a longer sentence, but it's still chopped up and it still makes you jump back and forth a little bit as you're going through it and really readjust a couple times. That's a really good point because it's it's the most like written quote unquote sentence of the thing. You know, like anything, everything else could be just something spoken. Like it could be a transcription of like, you know, I've been pregnant, I can't sleep, blah, blah, blah. I drink, I don't smoke. But as soon as we get to that turn and that um, that long sentence, it both acknowledges the fact of it being written in that self-reflexive moment. But as you were sort of saying, the wise as he was gives it a kind of the written texture. And it is sort of hard. That line is so great because it's like Uncle Ken, wise as he was, was hit. There's like two was's right after each other, which is kind of weird. There's three W's, wise as he was, was hit. And there's a kind of a uh sound that's going through it. You know, Uncle Ken, wise as he was. It has notes of literariness or something. It has a kind of like self-conscious aspect to it. In that it's way. the kind of like in, in non-poems or when it's not done intentionally, it's the kind of overwriting that you can fall into. Or at least I know I fall into very easily when I'm initially consciously thinking about wanting to phrase something really, I don't know, carefully or well, or creating a moment somewhere in a written piece, whenever I start thinking about it too much, this is what I end up doing. And it's bad when, when I'm doing it, like I, I recognize I'm doing, I'm like, Oh, not again here. It's really cool. And it's deployed with great purpose and it's neat and it adds something. But I think that it's the kind of writing that, you can very easily slip into that makes your work really weak when it's not outside of the context of poetry. I'm not saying it's bad here. Yeah. I love it here, but I know that I do this yeah. <laughs> in my not so great <laughs> moments as a, as a, you know, wannabe writer. You're too hard on yourself, Jack, but mm -hmm. I think you're really right in that. Yeah. When it's not working well, that kind of writing, it's like, you are trying very hard, my dear. Like those, mm -hmm. the, it's like, you're really putting a lot of effort in it. The effort, it's like when you see someone trying really hard and it's just sort of sad. Sometimes you watch people do something and it's obvious how hard it is to do it. And sometimes you watch people doing something hard and you look at it and think, oh, I could do that because they just hide how difficult it is. Yes. I think that shows up yes. a lot in the realm of sports. There are certain sports people who are like, so good, you can't tell how hard they're working at these incredibly difficult sports, like Olympic athletes and stuff like they just jump like 20 feet and you're like oh yeah okay and then there's another guy who goes and does it after them and he barely makes it you're like whoa what's this joker's problem when in reality they're two of the best in the world one of them just happens to make it look really easy because of whatever reason i think it's kind of falls into that category this is a very big tangent but 
Speaking of, all right, so when we were recording this, it's the day after March Madness, and we watched the finals. A great game, very exciting. I'm not like a huge sports person, but I really try hard when I watch, which I think is extra embarrassing for those with me who know uh, substantially more about the sport. But there was a time where just this guy made this, he was just driving the lane and he just skated around this person like it was no big deal. And the announcer was literally just saying, this is Virginia's top defender. And then he just dribbles around him. I mean, it's so insane. But it was this thing where I looked at it and I was like, oh yeah, like easy peasy. But then it's like, Holy crap. I mean, you got to be, it's the elegance and the grace. It's amazing, which I think is interesting. So we've sort of uh, spent a lot of time talking about why what Seeley did uh, would be less than desirable um, in that it is a sort of drawing attention to its own attempt at, you know, being written, right? It's, it's showing that it's trying in some kind of way. And I guess sort of the question is, because it's clearly deliberate, especially from how much it departs from the rest of the tone of the poem, which which is so sort of rooted in the familiar language of a medical history. I want to have a good answer to it, and I don't know if I do, but I sort of feel like there's this kind of sense of like, you know, you're you're somebody and you have a history and you have a family. All these people who came before you who have experienced X, Y, and Z. And also you're in a world that is cruel and is insistent on trying to kill you. And you're trying to, like, where does one go after that? And where does one find a place for oneself to make a choice or to... Do something that's not predetermined, maybe, or that's not fated. And in a way, the the speaker, by being self-reflexive, by showing this as a poem, by writing it in a way that's slightly more stylized, is giving us a sort of an effect of that the speaker is like working through this, I guess, rather than just like, these are the facts, but more like, here I am, here's my family, here's my history, and how do I write through it kind of thing. And so I I feel like it's, it's the attempt itself and the negotiation itself, which is why pesky Uncle Ken is so irritating to the speaker there's this it's just it's just interesting because especially that like thing because it's like you, then you imagine the whole poem is like the speaker's like assembling this list it's like I've got this theory like everything's going wrong and then they the poem's like halfway done and then it's like fuck Uncle Ken you just got hit by a car now I have to accommodate this in my theory to like find my way forward because if I can sort of understand my situation or have a you know a theory of my situation you know then I you know might have a a fighting chance or something I don't know that's like highly extrapolated yeah but that's really cool because then the line is working on the form level of displaying that struggle and on the content level of drawing attention to it by talking about the theory towards which writing is happening so I think that's probably right on. And one other thing that I like about this poem is one other aspect of medical, the medical history form or using that is it creates a kind of distance between the speaker and the reader and the speaker potentially and the subject. We talk a lot about distance, I think, on the podcast and how it's sort of a a big tool of writers. But it's interesting because it reminds me of the poem Nursing Home by Vijay Sashadri, which we talked about in an earlier podcast. And in that one, it's a three-part poem, Nursing Home. And each part is like wildly different, but they all sort of revolve around, you know, what we assume to be the speaker's mother or uh, grandmother or like some older relative who sort of has dementia or some some sort of condition in which they're 
their memory is is really failing and the second section is like medical gibberish almost it's like written in a very academic medical journal type style where we're talking about synapses and like and it's sort of similar to this in which you have this kind of language that is very emotionless and like technical and is also not your own language right it's like i'm speaking in medical history speak right i drink i don't smoke you know in the nursing home it's like the speaker's not writing like expressing their thoughts they're sort of adopting or mimicking this like other academic kind of style anyway i just i appreciated that because the topic is like very very heavy and there's this sort of strange way where the severity of what's being described is like totally undermined or like cut by just the the removedness of the discourse and i feel like the speaker is kind of using that language and that distance that the language provides as a way to well partly as a way to get the reader in without it being too hard because sometimes if you lead with just like really intense high voltage language and subject matter at the same time it's like whoa i mean i'm not i'm not ready for that i think what's so interesting to me about this poem is that by the end the last line i just find so gut wrenching is like it just like hits you hard and it's like and i understand the stars in the sky are already dead like when it, when i hear that line and when i read it for the first time i was like Jesus Christ. But I was like, why? I don't know why. Because when I thought about what it meant, I was like, I mean, you're talking about the stars now or something. And like, you're talking about something that was never alive. And why is the thing? It's like, why when you're talking about that, am I feeling this kind of way? And there seems to be this weird, like crossing paths of your content is like, is it about me? Or is it about not me? And then you have your tone and it's like, is it dry medical history language? Or is it like hard hitting poetic language, right? And the poem kind of like shoots them across each other. So you start like about me, you know, my medical history, but with the dry language. And then you end with like pretty intense tone but it's about the stars. It's as far away as you can get from yourself. And I don't really know why, but for some reason, there's like always some aspect that's removed from the self, but it's like, you can't have it where it's like lined up, I think. And so she gets you in with the dry language and you can just be removed from the kind of severity of what she's describing, which is like a family that's been, you know, chronically sick for generations. And then she can like sort of ram you at the end with this like pretty intense language, but it's about the stars. And it's all in 14 lines. It's a sonnet. It's crazy. <laughs> so good. Oh my God. One thing I was thinking about with that last line is that it is in some ways describing the universe as being infected with the disease of entropy, basically. Because like... The stars are already dead could be about how their light shines and we sometimes see it even after the star goes out. Or it could just be the fact that we know that the universe is going to end and like everything is fated to die one day. The universe is expanding. And I understand that gives me that sense of like, maybe this is more of a scientific thing, not just the science of how starlight happens, but maybe the science of the Big Bang and the expanding universe and the fact that, yeah, every star you see is going to go out one day. like. We all know that <laughs> it's not like it's yeah. big news or rocket surgery or something like we all know. It's also there's this other poem in the book and the last line is so good. And it's like, I'm going to miss you when we're dead. Whoa. It's really intense and you need to read the whole poem. But there's this sense of like missing beyond life kind of thing. And the stars are dead, but the light is still shining kind of thing. It does seem like there's this reaching for something past life and death that the speaker's like working toward. Should we read it again? Let's do it. Medical History by Nicole Seeley. 
I've been pregnant. I've had sex with a man who's had sex with men. I can't sleep. My mother has, my mother's mother had asthma. My father had a stroke. My father's mother has high blood pressure. Both grandfathers died from diabetes. I drink. I don't smoke. Xanax for flying. Propranolol for anxiety. My eyes are bad. I'm spooked by wind. Cousin Lily died from an aneurysm. Aunt Hilda, a heart attack. Uncle Ken, wise as he was, was hit by a car as if to disprove whatever theory toward which I write. And, I understand, the stars in the sky are already dead. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Those reviews help us with the algorithm and are the best way for us to find new listeners. Do you have thoughts about this poem? Or is there a poem or poet you'd like us to cover on a future episode? We would love to hear from you, and there are tons, tons of ways to get in touch. Yes, you can send us an email to close talking poetry at gmail.com or find us on Twitter. I'm at Jack Rossiter Munn. Connor is at Connor M. Stratton, and the show is at Close Talking. On Instagram, we are at Close Talking Poetry, and we are on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Close Talking. And speaking of all of those many and varied social media platforms, a very special thank you to our incredible social media manager, Corey China. Woo woo! Woo. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Come back again. Please come back. Just one more time. Door is always open. Okay, bye. I'll see you.